listening to Second Chance Ministry Radio. The following is entitled Bad Girls of the Bible. Enjoy and have a glorious day. 2. Bored to Distraction Heaven has no rage like love to hatred turned, nor hell a fury like a woman scorned. William Congreve Mitzi leaned across the breakfast table toward her husband, making sure she was offering him an eyeful. So, may I serve you something else before you head to the office? Apparently, his eyes were too full of the morning news to notice. Speaking of the office, honey, you're going to love the new guy. Christopher rustled the front pages of the Indianapolis Star with authority, not even glancing up to check if she was listening. Hired him last month, and already I can see potential. Joe's a real go-getter, but solid, too. The kind of man you can trust with the company bank book. Chris lowered the paper long enough to give her a meaningful wink. And everything else. Buster, if only you knew... But he didn't know, couldn't imagine how lonely her days were, waiting for him to get home from work and give her the attention she deserved. She rose from the soft tapestry cushions of one of her brand new dining room chairs, an expensive addition to a house already crowned with pricey furniture from the best stores on Allisonville Road. They'd lived in Indianapolis for a dozen years, but no matter how much she decorated the place, it still didn't feel like home. Home is where your husband is, her mother-in-law had chided her more than once. Then tell him to stay home, she'd snapped back. Mitzi poured Chris a fresh cup of his favorite custom-blended coffee, then another for herself, enjoying the rich aroma and smiling to herself. Delicious, yes, but not nearly as appealing as the musky aftershave Joe had been wearing at the company picnic last weekend. Did Christopher think she was blind, that she didn't see the handsome young guy with his lean muscles and big brown eyes? Fat chance I'd miss a hunk like that. She had eyed him at a distance, found an excuse to stand near him, then pretended not to notice him. Noticing me must have been the jumpsuit cut to there that caught his eye, precisely as she'd planned. Oh, she'd heard the rumors that he was a real do-gooder, lived a squeaky clean lifestyle, was religious to a fault. Perfect. She needed a challenge. Christopher was too easy to fool, too trusting. The man left her alone with no one to keep her company but a housekeeper, a gardener, and the UPS guy daily bringing her another box of flimsy lingerie ordered from one of her stacks of catalogs. Not that Christopher ever paid any attention to what she wore. The dinner menu now, that garnered his interest. He poured over back issues of gourmet and bon appetit, as if they were wholly writ. She, however, ate as little as possible. How else was she going to maintain her twenty-something figure with midlife knocking at her door? She needed Joe knocking at her door. That would put a little pep in her step, a little glide in her stride. Mitzi knew exactly how to make that dream come true, too. Her voice dripped like honey. Will you be home in time for dinner, Christopher? Not tonight, sweetheart. Snapping the paper shut and tossing it aside, he stretched to his feet. Meetings with the CEO all day. I'm his right-hand man, remember? Gotta be there to keep things on track. We're sponsoring a race car in the 500 this May, which means a longer-than-usual meeting right through lunch, right through dinner. The Indy 500. Fast cars, faster men. A shiver of delight tingled up her spine. He shrugged into his suit coat. I hate those catered boardroom meals. Tastes like cardboard. He tweaked her nose. Not like the feast my wife arranges for me. Rack of lamb, lobster bisque, blackened trout. He groaned with pleasure. Makes my mouth water just to think about it. Mitzi forced a smile to her lips. If only you knew how hungry I am, husband of mine. So, she sighed, when should I expect you? He twirled the keys to his Porsche around his finger. Probably won't get home until ten at the earliest. Why? Miss me already? Oh, I'll miss you all right. 
Joe will come and go before you ever darken this door. Not to worry. I'll be fine. He bent down to press his lips lightly on her forehead. Not even a kiss on the mouth? Who could blame her for looking elsewhere for love and affection? She was a passionate woman. She deserved a lover who was her equal. Joe was apparently gung-ho about experiencing joy in the spirit. Wait until he gets a taste of joy in the flesh. Mitzi casually waved at Christopher's car backing down the drive as she composed a mental list of the tasks required for the hours ahead. She made a few phone calls, told the gardener to take the day off, ditto with the housekeeper, hung a note from the front doorknob asking UPS to leave any packages on the porch. No doorbells ringing, please. She might be napping. Correction. She might be in bed if all went as planned. And not alone. Mitzi felt her palms sweating as she punched in the numbers for her husband's company. Not his private line. The switchboard. She inched her voice up a few notes and slipped in a southern drawl just to be safe. Joe and property management, please. She didn't know his last name. For that matter, he didn't know her first name. Better that way. When he came on the line, Mitzi dropped her voice back down to its usual husky pitch. Joe, this is Christopher's wife. She could almost hear his ears perk up, his voice take on a tone of respect. That's right, she purred. We saw each other at the picnic. So glad to have you as part of our family. She swallowed, stealing a quick glance at herself in the mirror to bolster her resolve. I need a favor, if you don't mind. Chris has already driven off and won't be back until late tonight. Unfortunately, he left behind his file on the race car sponsorship along with his cell phone, so I can't reach him. If he doesn't have this file for the meeting at ten, ah, I knew you'd understand. She listened to his warm, confident voice, feeling a flush begin at her toes and move slowly toward her hairline. Yes, he assured her, he'd be happy to come over. Might she give him directions? Oh, might she. He'd be there in thirty minutes, since the traffic on Route 465 was bound to be heavy. Would that be soon enough? Hurry, Joe, hurry. Moments later, she slipped into a steaming hot tub, brimming with fragrant bubbles. Calvin Klein, take me away! Her throaty laugh echoed around the tiled room. No, not Calvin. Joseph. Yes, she liked that. His given name. His biblical name, Mitzi realized with a sly grin. Toweling off, she slathered her skin with a liberal dollop of lotion, heavy with the scent of obsession, then flung open her closet doors. The scarlet gown, of course, fit her like a silk glove, left almost nothing to the imagination. Paired with a sheer gauzy robe with a single clasp, red slippers with little heels that made her legs look their shapeliest. Obsession sprayed everywhere. She bent her head to brush her hair in long strokes from the nape of her neck to the tawny gold ends, then tossed it over her shoulders, enjoying the feel of it tickling her nearly bare back. A brisk knock at the door sent her heart knocking in its cage. Joseph! She practically skipped down the stairs, then paused on the marble landing to catch her breath. Not so eager, she chided herself. Assuming an air of youthful innocence, she pulled open the heavy oak door and let a look of surprise dance across her face. Joe, you must be a man on a mission. I bet you made it out to my corner of the world in twenty minutes, tops. The handsome, dark-haired man looked shocked, then shifted his gaze to the planters on either side of the entrance. She took in his freshly shaven cheeks, now pink with embarrassment. His eyes, fringed with long, dark lashes, paused at half-mast while he tried hard to look anywhere but at her. Mitzi stretched out her hand to catch his, forcing him to meet her gaze. Silly man, have you never seen a woman in her pajamas? You merely got here too fast for me to change, that's all. The phone rang, and, well, you know. How easily lies slipped from her well-oiled lips— Come in, come in. Let me see if I can find that pesky file folder for you. Clearly reluctant, he followed her in, pulling his hand out of hers as quickly as he could. I'll wait here while you look. 
His voice sounded pinched. His expression was one of pure agony. Closing the door behind them, she toyed with locking it, then thought better of it, too calculated. She pretended to search for the imaginary folder, displaying her best assets, as she knelt and stretched around every shelf and table in the foyer and hall. Hmm, this might be harder than she'd thought. He looked so nervous. She offered him coffee, but he shook his head. A bagel, perhaps? No, he didn't want that. Couldn't eat a thing, he insisted. At least let me take your coat, she murmured, slipping it off his shoulders before he could protest, letting her hands brush against his shirt long enough to feel the tension in his muscles. Subtlety was getting her nowhere, she decided. They were both adults. Why be coy? She fixed her eyes on his with a brazen boldness. Joseph, do you know why I invited you here this morning? It's becoming clearer by the moment, ma'am. His voice was steady, firm. So were the lines of his mouth. Good, she nodded, relieved. Then we don't need to play games, do we? I want you, Joe. It's as simple as that. He cleared his throat and took a step backward, pressing his broad shoulders against the massive front door. Not simple at all. You're Christopher's wife. He gave me this job, promoted me to manager. He trusts me with... He trusts me with everything. She watched him gulp and wipe his hands along the sides of his suit pants. At least I'm making him sweat. It gave her a perverse pleasure to see how she affected him. Laughter spilled from her lips. Come to bed with me, Joe. Believe me, Chris not only won't know, he wouldn't care. Not entirely true, but Joe obviously needs convincing. He groped for the knob behind him, then yanked the door open with surprising force. You don't understand. It isn't only Christopher I'm worried about. This, this is a sin, a sin against the Lord, the Lord I love with all my heart. The Lord, she sputtered. What has God got to do with this? A grim smile moved across his face. Everything. Joe bolted down the stone path and into the company van before she could stop him, then started the engine with a grinding roar. The white vehicle careened down the driveway and backed onto the street, lurching forward with a squeal of tires. Well, she slammed the door in disgust. Now what? Bad enough that she'd been made to feel foolish. Dirty, even, blast his altar boy heart. The morning had been a waste of perfectly good perfume. Then it dawned on her. What if he told Christopher? Or blabbed to his co-workers and one of them told Christopher? No, no, that can't happen. It'd ruin everything. As she looked down, a wave of relief washed over her. His jacket. He'd left behind his jacket. Perfect. All the proof she'd need to show Chris what had really happened. Joe had shown up out of nowhere, caught her half-dressed, forced his way into the house. Yes, forced himself on her, but she'd refused, started screaming, and he took off in the van. Yes! His word against hers, and which one of them would her husband believe? His wife, of course. Even as she hit the redial button, Mitzi could feel the sweet taste of revenge rising in her throat. You'll pay, Joe, you'll pay, and more than a tithe of your income, you holier-than-thou jerk. Now it was time for some serious damage control. When she heard the receptionist's voice on the line, Mitzi snapped on a teary sob the way most women flick on a light switch. Uh, Betty, is that you? Oh, I'm, I'm so scared. Is Christopher there? Please tell him I need to talk to him. Yes, yes, interrupt the meeting right away. The most unbelievable thing has happened. A Bad Girl in Pharaoh's Court, Potiphar's Wife now Joseph had been taken down to Egypt. Potiphar, an Egyptian who was one of Pharaoh's officials, the captain of the guard, bought him from the Ishmaelites who had taken him there. Joseph found favor in his eyes and became his attendant. Potiphar put him in charge of his household, and he entrusted to his care everything he owned. Genesis 39, 1 and 4. The Bored Wife 
the hired man. It happened some 35 centuries ago, and still the story has the power to take our breath away at the audacity of a woman who thought she could ignore her marriage vows and graze in greener pastures. She was known simply as Potiphar's wife. The woman didn't even have a name, one of the major hussies of the Bible, and she didn't possess a simple moniker to call her own. The wife of, period. We can imagine her propped up against a stone pillar at one of Pharaoh's lavish feasts, adorned in her best-plated wig, drenched in her costliest perfume, the ancient equivalent of obsession, no doubt, when a woman of higher station strolled by in her spun gold sandals and pointed a ruby-ringed finger in her direction. Hmm, Potiphar's wife, isn't it? Potiphar. Her meal ticket, undoubtedly a big guy and not only in position. Potiphar was the head of Pharaoh's bodyguards, and as such was surely a large man, wide shoulders, bulging biceps, broad chest, the biggest and baddest of them all. Been around a while, past his youth, but not past his prime in the bodyguard business. Everyone knew Potiphar. No one cared enough to remember his wife's name. Many a man enjoys having a trophy wife to display on his arm. She's mine, his eyes say, as he pats his wife's soft hand possessively. Who knows if Potiphar's wife saw herself that way? It's possible she liked the title, liked the flicker of admiration she saw in a stranger's eyes when she introduced herself as the proud wife of Potiphar, a man who had access to the Egyptian courts and to the ear of Pharaoh himself. Or she may have grown weary of the limitations of the title, of having her entire being defined by her marriage to a powerful man. With a house full of servants, she clearly had too few responsibilities and too much time in her hands. As one writer put it, idleness became the soil that nourished her sinful thoughts. Potiphar's Wife Even without a name, she has become synonymous with lust and licentiousness. Did God know her name? Absolutely. Why is it not recorded in Scripture, then? One commentator suggested, There is no satisfactory answer to the silence of Scripture regarding the identity of its nameless women. And there were lots of them, good girls and bad girls both, identified by what they did, whom they married or gave birth to, or where they hailed from. More than a hundred women are simply described in Scripture as the daughter of, wife of, witch of, woman of, concubine of, widow of, nurse of, queen of, well, that one has merit, and naturally the mother of, someone more famous than she is. I know that one well. At my children's schools, I was known as the mother of Matthew, the mother of Lillian, or carpool mother number 27. I had no name, no identity. They recognized my minivan, but not my name. Aren't you Lillian's mother? Sigh. Potiphar's wife would have understood. Though she's infamously bad to the bone, she's also one of the no-names of the Bible. I'll bet Joseph knew her name. Joseph, the Hebrew boy sold into slavery by his jealous brothers, then chosen, purchased, that is, by Potiphar from the Ishmaelites. Our man, Mr. Potiphar, was known for physical prowess, certainly, Intellectual strength? Maybe not. Yet he did realize what a fine bargain he'd made in buying Joseph. In no time, Potiphar moved Joseph up the ladder from lowly servant to right-hand man for one reason. God was faithful to Joseph because Joseph was faithful to God. Potiphar knew a good thing when he saw it. So he left in Joseph's care everything he had. With Joseph in charge, he did not concern himself with anything except the food he ate. Genesis 39, 6 Am I the only woman who sees a red flag waving here? Potiphar's only concern was dinner? Breakfast and lunch, too. Snacks, maybe? One scholar suggested that Mr. P's preoccupation with food might have been due to the ritual separation outlined in Genesis 43, because Egyptians could not eat with Hebrews, for that is detestable to Egyptians. Or that Potiphar worried really about nothing any longer except his own food. Consider Potiphar himself. 
the beefy bodybuilder, the head of the guards, the muscle-bound bouncer, a man with an oversized appetite, busy caring for the needs of his stomach while ignoring the needs of his wife, who, we'll see in a moment, had a few hungers of her own that required tending. Make no mistake, she is the bad girl in this story, but her inattentive husband, with his belly full of food and a busy work schedule, unquestionably contributed to her wandering eye. And Joseph gave her plenty to gawk at. Now Joseph was well-built and handsome. Genesis 39, 6. Stop right there, girls. Most of our Bible heroes and heroines are not described in any physical detail. That makes these few words about Joseph, incidentally, the precise words used to describe his mother Rachel, take on even more importance. Call Joseph what you will, beefcake, hunk rama stud muffin. The man had serious curb appeal. He was young, attractive in form and face, bright, a fast learner, eager to serve, a natural leader. He was also in way over his head. Joseph, fresh from the fields and thrust into the corrupt luxury of city life in Egypt, had his faith and fidelity to God tested in short order. Hebrew to the core, he was nonetheless soon dressed in the white pleated garments of his adopted country, shaved and perfumed, an Egyptian in all save his blood. Ooh, baby. Joseph not only looked good, he knew he looked good. Beautiful Rachel, who had waited so long to have a child, must have lavished her son with praise, as did his father, Jacob, who called Joseph his favorite son, a label which, as we know, bugged his brothers plenty. Joseph, a handsome young man, a slave in name only, confident of himself and his God, paraded before an older woman who was neglected, needy, and hungry for attention. Honey, could anything but this have happened? And after a while, his master's wife took notice of Joseph and said, Genesis 39, 7, Hold it. After a while, how long, we wondered. What was she doing in the meantime? Spending time with another lover? Decorating her finely appointed rooms? Getting fitted for a collection of new, more revealing linen tunics? Or was she resisting temptation, looking the other way, hanging around the clay ovens in the kitchen, longing to be near her famished husband, hoping he'd drop his bowl of lentils long enough to give her the time of day? The truth is, we can't tell at this point in the story. This is her one big scene, after which Mrs. P. is never mentioned in Scripture again. She made quite an entrance, though, with her eye-popping opening line, Come to bed with me, Genesis 39, 7. The woman was not subtle. As the wife of a powerful man, she was clearly accustomed to getting exactly what she wanted. And what she wanted was Joseph, hubby's handsome slave. As a foreigner, Joseph was forbidden fruit, and Potiphar's wife knew that. It was undoubtedly part of the attraction. They were complete opposites. She was older, he was younger. She was married, he was single. She was Egyptian, he was Hebrew. She had no morals, he had high morals. She worshipped the flesh, he worshipped in spirit. Opposites do attract. Here, however, the electricity was flowing in only one direction, as his response indicates. But he refused, Genesis 39, 8. Details. We want details. We can picture her draped across a 15th century B.C. version of a king-sized sofa bed, batting her coal-rimmed eyes in his direction. We can picture this chick magnet with arms folded, chin held high, shaking his handsome Hebrew head. But such pictures are left to our imaginations. We only know that he refused. Period. Then Joseph explained why. With me in charge, he told her, my master does not concern himself with anything in the house. Everything he owns, he has entrusted to my care. No one is greater in this house than I am. Genesis 39, 8 and 9. Well, I guess he told her. Perhaps there'd been other slaves before Joseph who'd said yes to her advances. 
This one said no, not because he found her unappealing, but because the very idea of abusing the trust of his master and the laws of his lord made his freshly shaven Hebrew skin pale. My master has withheld nothing from me except you, because you are his wife. How then could I do such a wicked thing and sin against God? Genesis 39, 9 there is no suggestion that Joseph was genuinely tempted by her offer. Remember, we know that he was comely. We know nothing of her appearance. Was she herself beautiful, used to having young lovers falling at her feet? Or was she a plain woman who, by propositioning her own slave, was willing, in essence, to pay for his services? Or, a third possibility, was she suffering an Egyptian midlife crisis, wondering if she still had what it took to catch the eye of a younger man? The why really matters not. Adultery was a major no-no in ancient days, one of the most serious crimes. Only death was considered a sufficient penalty. For Joseph, it went deeper than that. He saw it as a sin against his God, Yahweh. Ten points for Joseph, zero for Potiphar's wife. If she'd quit there, apologized, and begged his forgiveness, she'd undoubtedly have been relegated to our list of bad-for-a-moment girls. But as the first sensualist in the gallery of scriptural women, she pressed the point. Scorned by a slave, an uppity slave at that, she persisted in her pursuit of the stubborn lad. And though she spoke to Joseph day after day, he refused to go to bed with her or even be with her. Genesis 39.10 As the song sort of says, And here's to you, Mrs. Potiphar. Joseph loathes you more than you will know. Whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> whoa is right. Stop already with the come-hither glances and the languid smiles, Mrs. P. But she didn't stop. Day after day means we could hardly chalk this up to a weak moment on her part. She was morally corrupt and persistent to a fault. She did lower her sights, though, seeking a compromise with Joseph. Just be with me, then? Keep me company? The words of a forgotten woman. Honestly, where was old Potiphar? Still banging together those pots and pans while his wife tried to get something cooking in their bedroom? Guarding Pharaoh when he should have been guarding his wife's reputation? Hers was a sin of commission, her husband's one of omission. He should have paid more attention to her, we might argue, spent his time building hedges around their marriage with vines of love and affection, instead of building a name for himself in Pharaoh's court. But the worst sin Potiphar can be accused of is ignorance. His wife, however, stands accused of sinning against a foreign god she didn't comprehend, one who has a moral interest in his people. What a concept for an Egyptian! Her only god was her body and its physical appetites. Though she didn't know Yahweh, her adulterous behavior still broke one of the cardinal rules of her age. Men of the time could have many wives, but a wife was bound to absolute fidelity and could belong to only one man. Mrs. P. was bad to the bone indeed. She didn't give a fig or a grape leaf about Joseph's God or his morals. In fact, she no doubt found the challenge appetizing. We don't know her heart, black as it appears. We don't know her history. We don't know if she was ruled by her lust or lonely to the core. We do know that her pride wouldn't let her take Joseph's no for an answer. One day he went into the house to attend to his duties, and none of the household servants was inside. Genesis 39.11 Uh-oh, an empty house? At whose doing? None of the servants? It's hard to believe that wasn't arranged. Enter Mrs. P., who might aptly be portrayed the way actress Tallulah Bank had once described herself, pure as driven slush. She caught him by his cloak and said, Come to bed with me. But he left his cloak in her hand and ran out of the house. Genesis thirty nine twelve. Don't let that cloak thing fool you. Other translations call it his garment, which was actually an undergarment, a long shirt tied at the hips. After all, he was inside the house. No coats required. 
Let's ask the obvious question. Why was Joseph close enough for her to grab his unmentionables in the first place? Was she hiding behind curtain number three, waiting to grab him as he strolled by in his master's business? Or did Joseph get closer than he should have, then abruptly change his mind? Since he faithfully refused her day after day, we'll assume it was Mrs. P's antics all the way. Clearly, she set Joseph up, caught him by surprise, and left him no choice but to flee into the courtyard, as one scholar noted, completely undressed, at once disgracefully and honorably. Many a man has left evidence of his indiscretions, but poor Joseph was merely trying to get away with his virtue intact, if not his wardrobe. He could hardly risk going back, even though he surely knew where all this would lead. Perhaps Paul was thinking of young Joseph when he wrote, Flee the evil desires of youth and pursue righteousness. Joseph, righteous to the end, took off running. Try as we might to look at all viewpoints in this dramatic scene, there's no question that Joseph did right in the eyes of God, and Potiphar's wife showed her true colors. Unlike Joseph's coat of many colors, hers came in one shade, solid black. When she saw that he had left his cloak in her hand and had run out of the house, she called her household servants. Look, she said to them, this Hebrew has been brought to us to make sport of us. Genesis 39, 13 and 14. She hollered to her household servants, eh? The same one she had sent outside while she pitched her woo? My, how this woman loved to order people around. She didn't succeed in committing adultery with Joseph, but she was very successful in lying, pinning the blame on this Hebrew, insisting he shamed not only her, but us. Scorned by the upright slave, she turned her passion into a prejudicial put-down. He came in here to sleep with me, but I screamed. When he heard me scream for help, he left his cloak beside me and ran out of the house. Genesis 39, 14 and 15. Gee, I didn't hear a scream. Did you hear a scream? Any scriptwriter worth his salt would flag such a glaring oversight. If Mrs. P. had really screamed while Joseph was still there, making sport of her, as it were, wouldn't the servants have come running and stumbled over the hot-footing at Joseph? Instead, after the young man was long gone, then she had to yell for them to come in. They were servants, yes, but they were not fools. If the boss lady said she screamed for help, so be it. Notice not a single response from the servants is recorded. Maybe they saw through her lies. Maybe they saw the fleeing Joseph. Without his cloak, he would have been hard to miss, tearing across the courtyard. Maybe they had also come to her demands themselves at one time or another, and now served as her kangaroo court, ready to pass judgment on the innocent Joseph, that Hebrew. Besides, she did have the man's cloak in hand. That was proof enough for anybody, even Mr. P. She kept his cloak beside her, until his master came home. Genesis thirty nine sixteen. Any lingering drop of sympathy for the woman dries up with this single-line scenario. You can imagine her sliding her hands over the threads of the cloak next to her, perhaps even holding it to her face, breathing in the scent of Joseph's body, letting her lust turn to anger, then revenge, then a bald-faced lie. She accused the innocent Joseph of the very behavior of which she herself was guilty. An evil woman scorned is frightening to behold. One writer noted how quickly the heat of her passion hardened into hatred. The vitriol of Mrs. P.'s dark soul echoes through the ages. How dare he reject me, the fool! Wait until Potiphar hears about this. Might Mrs. P. be the woman mentioned in Proverbs? For the lips of an adulteress drip honey, and her speech is smoother than oil. But in the end, she is bitter as gall, sharp as a double-edged sword. One smooth lie always begets another. This lie was so smooth it sailed right over poor Potiphar's head. When his master heard the story his wife told him, saying, This is how your slave treated me, he burned with anger. Genesis thirty-nine nineteen. 
Oh, that's rich. Your slave. In other words, it was Potiphar's fault for bringing this Hebrew into her presence in the first place. I'm reminded of Adam's answer to the Lord's question about why he'd tasted the forbidden fruit. The woman you put here with me. In other words, you gave her to me, Lord. Your fault. Your fault. Adam didn't get away with that one. Did Mrs. P's blame shifting work for her? Potiphar got angry, but at whom? Joseph was the obvious target of his wrath, although if Potiphar had been truly convinced of the young Hebrew's guilt, the punishment would have been clear and swift, death for the foreigner. Wasn't Potiphar the chief guard? All would have believed Potiphar. But Potiphar believed Joseph, the man he had entrusted with all his worldly goods. He couldn't kill a man he knew in his heart to be innocent. Joseph's master took him and put him in prison, the place where the king's prisoners were confined. Genesis thirty nine twenty. Prison, yes. Death, no. In fact, Joseph was soon put in charge of the prison, started interpreting Pharaoh's dreams, and, well, you know the rest. But what of Potiphar's unfaithful wife? One author suggested that Potiphar's fierce, possessive love blinded him to the wickedness thinly veiled to all but him. That veil isn't thin, babe. It's transparent. I think Potiphar had sufficient gray matter to see through his wife's lies, enough to spare Joseph and, in truth, to avoid adding to his own shame. The innocent got hauled off to jail. The guilty got away with murdering a young man's reputation. In one fell swoop, Potiphar's wife managed to commit a whole host of sins without blushing, let alone repenting. Sadly, she was not only a sensualist, but a coward who could not admit to her own guilt. This one's for you, Mrs. P. There are six things the Lord hates, seven that are detestable to him. Haughty eyes, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked schemes, feet that are quick to rush into evil, a false witness who pours out lies, and a man who stirs up dissension among brothers. Proverbs six sixteen through 19 Seven points for Mrs. P, all on the losing side. While Yahweh stood by Joseph, in jail and everywhere else, Potiphar's wife was left alone in her own sort of prison, its iron bars forged from lust, revenge, and lies. Her warden? Hubby, dearest, his eyes smoldering with a lingering distrust. What lessons can we learn from Mrs. P.? we got to stay on our toes. We never know when temptation will arrive at our doorsteps. We can't assume that because we're happily married or content in our singleness, a hunky delivery guy or a cute carpenter working on our new guest room can't possibly shift our fertile imaginations into overdrive. It happens to Christian women every day with tragic consequences. Be very careful, then, how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity, because the days are evil. Ephesians five fifteen and 16. It's smart to surround ourselves with support. Mrs. P sent the servants away. Bad move, honey. Let's leave the office door open when we meet with the male co-worker. Take the kids with us when we sit outside to chat with the handsome handyman. Not to mention making sure we're appropriately dressed. Carry along a photo of hubby when we travel and display it on the nightstand. We're one-man women, right? Married to an earthly husband or a heavenly one, our motto is, never leave home without him foremost in our hearts and minds. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. Ephesians six eleven. Let's seek out our husbands before, not after. If movie stars and paperback heroes are filling our minds with images that don't honor God or our husbands, suppose we find those men of ours in the kitchen, the garage, wherever, wrap our arms around their broad shoulders, and whisper the same words that Mrs. P. first said to Joseph. If you're married to the man, it's not only legal, it's biblical. 
Trust me, Joseph may have refused, but your hubby will undoubtedly be delighted with your invitation, however unexpected it may be. Your desire will be for your husband. Genesis 3.16 When we stumble, confession beats a cover-up. How easy it is to blame someone else when we're tempted to sin. It's his fault, her fault, or when all else fails, it's God's fault. Potiphar may not have seen through his wife's lies, but the Lord we love looks straight into our hearts. Instead of going for a cover-up, let's confess and repent. The snazziest lipstick in the world can't compete with clean lips and a clean heart. Save me, O Lord, from lying lips and from deceitful tongues. Psalm 120, verse 2. You are listening to Second Chance Ministry Radio.